Welcome to this week's edition of Ask an MS Expert. I'm John Strom, and I'm the host of the Real Talk MS podcast. Each week, Real Talk MS reaches thousands of people in more than 90 countries around the world with the news that people affected by MS need to know. I'm also a non-scientist member of the International Progressive MS Alliance Scientific Steering Committee. I'm a district activist leader for the National MS Society, and I chair the Society's California Government Relations Advisory Committee. My wife, Jean, lived with Progressive MS for 23 years, so I've had a front row seat experiencing all the ways that MS can impact a family. I'm thrilled to be with you today. I see that people are continuing to join our webcast, so let's give them just another few seconds, and then we'll get started. I want to thank all of you who are joining us on GoToWebinar, Facebook Live, and YouTube Live. The MS Society's Ask an MS Expert webcast is designed to connect you with MS experts who are ready to answer your questions on the very topics that impact people affected by MS every day. So as I chat with our expert today, Please feel free to post your questions on Facebook and YouTube or type them into the question box if you're joining us on GoToWebinar. We'll try to answer as many of your questions as we can during the Q&A portion of today's program. Since the outbreak of COVID-19, telemedicine has rapidly become the new way for people to communicate and visit with their doctor. Today, we're talking with Dr. William Metter, a board-certified neurologist and associate professor in the Department of Neurology in the MS and Neuroimmunology Division at the University of Alabama Birmingham School of Medicine. Dr. Metter is co-director of the Interprofessional Transverse Myelitis Clinic at UAB and serves as the Ambulatory Medical Quality Officer for UAB Neurology. Dr. Metter steered UAB Neurology's rapid transition to telemedicine delivery at the start of the COVID-19 pandemic and continues to refine the delivery of telemedicine for UAB Neurology. I'm looking forward to getting his perspective on how patients and their doctors are navigating through this new environment. And we'll discuss the benefits, challenges of telemedicine and how to make the most out of your telemedicine visit. Welcome, Dr. Metter, and thank you for being with us today. Due to the COVID-19 pandemic, telemedicine visits were integrated into medical care at what felt like light speed. And this is a new way to participate in care for both patients and healthcare professionals, which means there's going to be a learning curve attached. So to begin with some definitions, we often hear the terms telehealth and telemedicine. Do these two terms mean the same thing or are there any differences? That's a great question, John, and thank you all for having me. Um, so telemedicine refers to the clinical care delivery of care over a teleplatform. Um, so that's a clinical care visit, such as a clinic visit over video. Telehealth is a more inclusive term, and so that's going to refer to other um, varieties of delivery of care, such as sending a message to your care provider through a portal system. Um, it may include documenting vital signs at home and uploading that into the medical record. Um, so it's more encompassing of, of total telehealth. Well, in our past programs, we've referred to telemedicine visits as virtual visits. So I'd like to continue using that terminology today just for the sake of consistency. Uh, I'm curious, what are some of the platforms that are being used for virtual visits? So some of the platforms that are used are doxy.me or Amwell or other platforms that a healthcare system may employ or contract with. And then there's freestanding services such as Teladoc and others that you can call if you don't have a doctor to get an appointment. What advantages are you observing from virtual visits? Uh, I'm wondering, are there any specific benefits that you've seen for people living with MS? I think transportation is always um, tricky for many of our patients, and so that's nice that they don't have to leave their home, and that's great. Um, also seeing patients in their home environment, um, and then this situation, being able to see someone's face and see how they're dealing um, emotionally with COVID-19, the pandemic, and their disease in general is, is a great advantage to video visits. 
I think that so many of us are already using virtual platforms to stay in touch with friends and family. I'm wondering, are you finding that that's creating a, a greater level of comfort with technology among the patients you're seeing? Absolutely. I think many of us were fairly novice in our ability to, to do tele video connections with our family or friends. Um, but now that that's kind of commonplace, unfortunately, uh, I think many of our patients are familiar with it from a personal experience. And that's really helped telehealth grow. And I think it helps patients buy in because they're used to the systems. Are you finding that telemedicine is helping to decrease no shows or appointment cancellations? Absolutely. Um, the number of patients that we see in our clinic has actually gone up during COVID-19. And that's mostly driven by the fact that we have fewer no-shows or same-day cancellations. In fact, it's been cut in half in our MS clinic. And so that really allows us to take care of more people. We're, we're able to see more patients. And I think that's been one great development through this pandemic. Are you noticed that you're seeing patients who would typically struggle to come to clinic? As you mentioned, those who are dealing with some sort of physical disability, and then there's also just geographic distance that can get in the way. Absolutely. And we were worried about that initially in the pandemic, um, that maybe patients with um, lower socioeconomic status or, or financial resources wouldn't be able to take advantage of video telehealth. Uh, we actually did not find that to be true, thankfully, because many people were having trouble physically getting to clinic. And it was much easier to come up with a smartphone than it was to get a ride to, to clinic. So it's actually improved access for many patients in those situations. Well, that's really good to hear. I was curious whether you were running into patients who were having difficulty just accessing the internet. Given the fact that you're not, I'm wondering, are, are you having to deal with patients who may not have access to a device with a camera? We do, and, and we can still you know, help patients over the phone. Obviously, that is less ideal. We like to be able to examine you, which I think we'll talk more about later, but um, video is important. And so if you have a neighbor, a family member who has a video capable phone or computer or laptop or tablet, um, you know, asking to borrow it for your visit, I think would be a wise decision. Well, you just mentioned the examination, and I think it would be really helpful if you could walk us through what a virtual visit might be like for someone with MS, starting with how do you go about conducting that neuro exam? Yeah, so we can actually do a lot of the neuro exam over video, and I think that's one point that patients aren't aware of um, when we connect. And so they're often surprised when I ask them to set the camera up on a countertop so that I can watch them walk or move or to examine them. Um, but that's the benefit of video telehealth, right? And so I think that's why video is so important. And I think being prepared for that um, going into the visit is important. Being aware that that's going to happen is important for patients to understand. Well, I think that's one of the reasons why this conversation that we're having is so useful, because it will help people prepare. And we'll talk about that in a moment. Uh, I, I want to get back to the, the exam for a minute, that appointment. Uh, how are things like... Um, cranial nerve and motor function assessments done via telemedicine? Yeah, so we can actually accomplish most of the neurologic exam over video. And so that would include cranial nerve examination. That's looking at your eye movements, looking at the symmetry of your face, your ability to move your tongue or lips or palate. Um, we can do all of those over video. It is difficult to assess visual acuity, you know, how well you can read, for example. Um, and all, obviously we can't examine the back of your eye to look for evidence of optic neuritis, but we can pretty much do most of the other cranial nerves um, on the physical exam over video. Um, when it comes to motor strength and, and movement, uh, we can do a lot with coordination, right? So of, oftentimes your doctor will ask you to touch your nose or, or touch an object in front of you. They'll ask you to walk. Um, which is another big element of the physical exam in neurology, especially in multiple sclerosis. And we need to see you walk, and that's very important. Um, so I think setting the room up and, and so that you can do that is important. Um, we can test sensation. That one's a little bit trickier. Um, so it's asking you to touch your arm or your leg, and does it feel the same? Um, so that one's a little bit lower yield, but we can assess that. And then, of course, reflexes. Assessing reflexes is not really achievable over video. Um, but like I said, we can really do the, the vast majority of the neurologic exam, and we can make treatment decisions based on a video examination. What about MRIs? Can images be reviewed in a virtual visit? 
how nice would it be if you could just turn your phone around and scan your brain? That would be great. Um, but we can arrange any test that we need after a visit. Um, it may take some coordination and it may take uh, the you know, a role of the patient to get involved in that, and especially if we're trying to arrange a scan at your local facility, um, not at the healthcare facility where your provider works. Um, so we can still arrange those. I think a lot of patients I've interacted with come into the visit thinking, you know, this is like a half a visit or this isn't a real visit. Um, but I order MRIs. I send medications to their pharmacy. I order lab work. I do all of the things I would do if they're in person. It's just there may be some coordination of care that needs to happen on a local level. And what about reviewing those MRIs once they are actually done? Can you share your screen so someone can actually see an image if you want to describe something on it? Great question, John. And yes, we can. And again, I've had some pleasant surprises by patients when I get to pull up their scan and it's on their computer or their phone. I get to walk them through. I would say for that type of activity, having the connection done on a laptop or a tablet where the screen is larger is gonna be much more beneficial. It's pretty hard to see the MRI on a smartphone. Um, even with good eyes, it's challenging. So um, if you have the opportunity to do it on a webcam enabled laptop or tablet, that will make it more successful. But yes, we, we can look at the scans together and I can walk you through them. Well, I know you mentioned that there were a couple of uh, optic related exams that are difficult to do. It, are there other things that can't be done through a telemedicine visit? So typically we would check labs on the day of the visit to coordinate care or check an MRI on the day of the visit to coordinate care so that it was kind of one-stop shopping, so to speak, for our patients. Um, now that's going to be a separate visit to a lab or a separate visit to a radiology screen. So there's some ancillary tests we might not be able to do. But as far as the clinic visit is concerned, you know, we can't assess for spasticity. That's that stiffness that causes muscle spasms. We can watch you walk and we can detect some of that, but we can't do a full assessment of the, the tone or the tightness of your muscles, if you will. And again, we can't assess reflexes. And the visual examination is, is fairly impaired over video, uh, which makes it more important to make sure that you're following with an eye doctor or eye specialist as well. Well, I know you mentioned a little bit about being able to order the tests afterwards as if someone were in clinic, but since we're kind of going through this virtual visit, we're at the end of our visit now. And when someone is at the clinic, they go through a checkout process. As you mentioned, other tests can be ordered or completed at that time. Um, and that can still all happen, it sounds like, when, when you're seeing patients virtually. Absolutely. And depending on, you know, communication preferences uh, that you've made with your healthcare system, they, mail, they may mail you a letter with your appointment. They may text you when your next appointment's going to be. They may call you. And again, that depends on your health system or the clinic that you go to, as well as your preferences that you've stated before. Um, so our patients get a text message about when their next appointment is going to be, when it's scheduled. And that happens just as if they were in clinic. Um, lab work can be a little tricky, right? So you're not physically present. So that might take printing out a lab and mailing it to you or faxing it to your local lab. So I do encourage patients um, in my own visits with patients to make sure that we're following up on that. And again, because we're coordinating care, maybe from one health system to another, uh, it may uh, be helpful to enlist patients, but the things that need to happen will happen. And I think that's the key takeaway. What's insurance coverage generally like for virtual visits? So during the pandemic and during the state of emergency, most healthcare insurance plans, um, close to all of them, are waiving copays for virtual visits. They're trying to encourage patients to be evaluated virtually. Um, so sometimes your copay may be waived for these visits. In other situations, you may have a copay just as if you saw the doctor in the clinic. Um, but insurance um, is pretty broadly covering it right now. Um, we're not sure what's going to happen in the future, but it is well covered right now, just as if you're seeing your doctor in the clinic. You may actually have the benefit of not having a copay. A few minutes ago, we talked very briefly about patients who may live a distance away from the clinic and being able to see them. Are you able to see patients who might live out of state and then still bill their insurance? 
So that's tricky. Um, so it's not so much an insurance payment issue, nor is it a willingness of the provider or the patient. It's more of a, a licensing issue. And so if we're providing care to patients in another state, then we're technically practicing medicine in another state. Um, and so that's often discouraged for obvious reasons. Um, however, it's not quite black and white. There's a lot of gray areas there. And so when we look at that, you know, is it continuation of care? Is it a phone call follow-up visit where we're just talking about what we did at the last clinic visit where that might be allowable? Um, but if we're addressing new issues, then we're delivering care. And we have to be careful with that from a legality issue. So unfortunately for many of our patients that we take care of at UAB who live out of the state, we are actually asking them to come in person because we're not able to see them officially in their state. I understand that there are some states that are already trying to pass legislation to eliminate that roadblock. So yes, uh, so some states when the pandemic hit said for any adjoining state, if you're licensed in an adjoining state, we're gonna allow you to, to see patients in our state, which I think was wise, right? If you live on the border of a state and you see a doctor 10 miles away, but they happen to be in a different state, um, that's a big disadvantage for you. And so I think that was helpful, but not every state did that. Um, I think the state medical licensing boards are looking at this, how they can um, responsibly expand coverage. Um, and I think there's more to come on that. Oh, I'm sure you're right. I'm curious, overall, how are your patients reacting to using telemedicine? They love it. Um, so we look at something called a net promoter score, which is a distillation of several questions that we ask patients. Um, and it's basically for this encounter with your healthcare system and provider, how likely are you to recommend it? Our net promoter scores have gone up significantly in telemedicine. And so I think patients really like it. Well, thank you, Dr. Matter, for sharing some really helpful insights into the benefits of telemedicine. Before we get into discussing how to go about preparing for that visit and, and, and making sure you get the most out of your time there as a patient, I want to take a moment to welcome those of you who have continued to join us on GoToWebinar, Facebook Live, and YouTube Live. Please let us know what's on your mind. Post your comments and questions on Facebook and YouTube, or type them into the question box if you joined us on GoToWebinar. Our Ask an MS Expert live event takes place at the same time every Friday, so please help us make sure that everyone knows about it by sharing news about the webcast with your family and your friends. We're talking with Dr. William Metter from the University of Alabama in Birmingham, and I'd like to shift gears a little bit now and focus on how to make the most of those telemedicine visits. Uh, Dr. Metter, how can patients best prepare for a virtual visit with their doctor? I think the one thing that is unchanged is to have an agenda. And when you go into a doctor's visit, whether it's virtual or in person, think about the things that you want to accomplish in that visit and lay them out early in the discussion with your provider. Um, line them out so that you can make sure that everything is covered that you want covered. Now, in addition to that, for virtual visits, I think the biggest thing is if you have the opportunity to do a test connection or to connect to the system via video before the visit, I would strongly encourage you to do that, whether that happens when you're doing your triage with the nurse intake person or whether that's the website that runs the software that you're using. Try to do a test connection to make sure everything works. That, that's a great tip. Um, you know, you mentioned whether you're having an in-person appointment or a virtual appointment, ha having that agenda, having those questions written down is helpful. Is it also helpful to have someone else with you during a virtual visit? Ideally, yes. And so getting back to that examination that we talked about earlier, when we're watching you walk or watching you move, if you have a camera person uh, with you that can help us with the camera uh, angles or getting you in the camera uh, field, that's really important. It doesn't have to happen, but if it can be made available, I think that's important. Well, having to take that walk at home brings up another question. What about your setup at home? Is there anything that patients should keep in mind as they get ready for a virtual appointment. 
Yeah, I think uh, a lot of us work from home novices uh, going into the pandemic have learned a lot of lessons about working from home. And I think the same is true of virtual visits. So we want to find a quiet place so that we're not interrupted so we can focus on your care and your well-being. Uh, we want it to be well lit so we can see the muscle movements of your face and your arms and watch you walk. Uh, we want to have an area or a physical space where you can walk. Um, so if it's a small room, can we can we do it near a hallway at least so we could watch you walk down the hallway, for example? Um, and I think those are, are key elements. Um, if you're in a home using Wi-Fi, uh, being close to the Wi-Fi router uh, is important so you get a good signal. Um, but I think a quiet place that's well lit with an opportunity to move around the room comfortably are the most important elements. Well, when it comes to the technology of a virtual visit, you mentioned making sure you have a, a good, strong Wi-Fi signal, uh, checking to make sure your equipment is ready to go. Any other tech tips that you could share with us? Uh, I think updating software is important. Um, so a lot of times we have issues because people don't have the most up-to-date version of their Android or, or iOS software. So just making sure that your phone is up-to-date and its uh, program software is important. Uh, Dr. Metter, we've heard from Connie, who says she has a follow-up with her neurologist that's been scheduled via a video conference. She's never done a visit this way, and Connie's actually considering canceling until she can see her doctor in person. What advice can you offer to Connie or anyone who's never done a virtual visit and might be a little apprehensive about it? Um, I think two things. Uh, one, when the pandemic started, a lot of patients canceled their appointment and said, I'll come back when you're seeing people in person regularly. Um, we initially thought, okay, we'll see in three months. And now it's, well, maybe a year. So I think this is the new normal for now. Um, virtual visits do not replace in-person visits by any stretch of the imagination, but they're as close as we can get. And I think most patients who are apprehensive that I've interacted with in their telehealth visits initially actually embraced it at the end of the visit. And they were very appreciative of the ability to do it from home. And so I think if you just give it a chance, um, then, then you might be surprised. And if you give it a chance and it just doesn't work for whatever reason, it's not to say that you can't come in person later on. So it's not like you're committing to telehealth forever. What are the most common questions that you get asked during a telemedicine visit? Honestly, the most common question that I've gotten recently is, can I do this for every visit? Um, a lot of our patients love it. Um, you know, they don't have to deal with a parking deck or traffic or, you know, walk a few blocks to the visit. And so most of our patients are asking, can we please continue this? Um, but I think other questions are, you know, are you going to be able to order that MRI or can I do the MRI at my house now that I'm not having to drive to the healthcare facility? Um, those sorts of questions. And as I said before, we can do whatever we need to do after the visit. It just might take some coordination and it might take a little bit on, on your part to make sure we're getting the labs done or getting the MRI arranged at your facility with our assistance, of course. Well, following on to that popular question you're being asked, can we, can we continue doing this? What do you see as the role for telemedicine once we're past the pandemic? So I think for MS patients, for people who are relatively stable and haven't had a lot of disease activity or a lot of disease symptomatic changes recently, I think video visits are excellent. Um, it reduces your exposure to people who might be sick, not with COVID, just with the flu or a cold um, in the clinic. It um, reduces burden of travel, which for many MS patients is significant. Um, so I think long term for people who are relatively stable and are on a good path, as it relates to their multiple sclerosis, I think telehealth is excellent. I do think that I don't want to, for patients to think that it replaces in-person visits again. I think we need to examine you in person periodically, whether that's once a year at a minimum or twice a year or once every two years at a minimum. It just depends on your clinical course. But I think some complement of both telehealth and in-person visits should be the future. And I think it will be. Are there any improvements you'd like to see that might enhance virtual visits as they exist today? So getting back to one of your earlier questions about no-shows or same-day cancellations and, and these slots that go unfilled because we can't fill them at the last minute. 
um, how nice would it be if you were waiting to see your doctor and the visit wasn't for two weeks or a month and you got a text and said, if you can be ready in 20 minutes, you can see your doctor. And I think it opens up access. I think it's gonna give patients a more direct line to doctors. It's gonna allow us and healthcare providers in general, it's gonna allow us to fill up those schedules more and allow more patients to be seen. So I think that's a great boon that's gonna come in the future. Well, you've shared a lot of really helpful information today, Dr. Metter. What would you say are the top three takeaways that our audience should keep in mind? I think the first thing is to you know, give telehealth a chance. And I think that uh, there's a lot of concern about security. These systems are as secure as they can be. Um, nothing is, is you know, hack proof technically, but they're as secure as they can be. And it's quite convenient. So give telehealth a chance and try it out. Um, the other thing would be preparing for your meeting. Um, your clinic visit, preparing, having an agenda set, whether you're in person or virtual. And if you're virtual, making sure you've used the system before so that it works uh, would be the second thing. And then I think the third thing is that virtual medicine does not replace in-person medicine. There's still going to be times where we need to bring you in and we need to examine you physically speaking to treat you. So don't think that if you choose telehealth, that that's it. Uh, we're always going to be available to see you in person if the need arises. Well, thank you, Dr. Metter, for sharing your expertise and helping all of us get more comfortable with telemedicine. Now I'd like to focus our time on addressing more of the questions that our audience has for you. We've heard from Christine, who says, how can you effectively communicate physical symptoms to your provider during a virtual visit? I think, again, and this is true for in-person visits too, to think about your symptom before you speak with your provider. And so really try to break it down. When does it hurt? What does it feel like? What makes it worse or better? And have those ideas in your mind or even write them down. You know, uh, memory trouble can be common in MS. Uh, so maybe you write down the time of day that it hurts the most or what activities make it feel different or numb. And so that will help your healthcare provider drill down and understand better what's going on, but the, the history taking element, the, the portion where you're providing information, your provider's asking questions, is virtually identical over video versus in person. Well, Daryl has a question that I think may be on the minds of a lot of our viewers. Daryl says, how is our privacy protected during virtual visits? Is it possible someone could hear our conversation or watch our video? Great question and a big concern. And I think something we have to address, absolutely. Um, so as I said before, the systems that are employed for this um, are HIPAA compliant. Now in the uh, state of emergency of the pandemic, HIPAA has been relaxed so that if a provider can't connect to you via video through a HIPAA compliant, technically they can use a non-HIPAA compliant software or platform. But the, the software platforms that are used by health systems and health clinics specifically for telehealth, are HIPAA compliant. That bar is incredibly high for data security. Um, again, nothing is perfect, but it's a very secure system. Also, you should be in a private location. I've had patients connect to me on video and they're seated in a, in a public area. And I've had to ask them to please go somewhere private because I don't want to discuss your health care in front of others. Uh, so there's your side of the coin too. So being in a quiet private area and your healthcare provider should be in a quiet private area as well. Stacy is asking the same question so many of your patients seem to be asking. Do you think we'll be able to continue virtual visits after the pandemic ends? Yeah, that's, that's the trillion dollar question right now. And no one really knows the answer and I can explain briefly why. So before the pandemic, the site of service was where the patient was located. So what that means is if you're giving care to someone, were they in a clinic, an ER, an urgent care, et cetera. And home did not qualify as a site of care for insurers. And that was true for the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services or CMS. And that was true for all the private insurers for the most part. So you couldn't be at home and to be delivered care for, for most insurance plans. When the pandemic happened, that was wiped away. And so everyone said, you can be at home. And that was the biggest obstacle. So if insurers continue that um, or remove that exclusion so that patients can be seen at home, then we can continue telehealth for the foreseeable future. And I think they're going to do that, but it's gonna take advocacy. If patients like this platform, patients like yourselves, 
you need to go to your insurer and say, I want this to continue. We need to push them to continue this. Well, while you and I have been busy talking, Julie Feel has been in the background collecting questions from our viewers. And Julie, uh, have you picked up a few questions for Dr. Metter? We have. People have been busy listening and sending their questions to us. Um, I, I've heard some positive statements too. I wanna start out by saying Jacqueline is really loving telemedicine. She says it's been great for her. She gets to avoid the stress of driving 45 minutes to see her MS healthcare provider. So I just, it, it goes along with what you've been saying. Um, providers are loving it, patients are loving it, but I think what I'm hearing you say, Dr. Metter, is it's not gonna be a full-time replacement for your in-person visit, but enjoy it while we can and when we can. Yeah, I think I think it could be a permanent complement to, to MS care delivery, um, but it's, it's not a replacement for in-person visits. For example, uh, many of you are familiar with secondary progressive MS. Um, which can happen very gradually. And so people can begin to worsen very gradually to the point they might not notice a change, but I might examine them and over time notice that their hip flexors or their knee extension muscles are weaker. And I might say, you know, I've noticed this weakness that's developing and you'd be surprised how many times patients say, yeah, I have had more trouble kind of getting up from the, the lower cabinets if I'm getting a pot out or something along those lines. And we detect changes that we need to act on and it might change therapy. So again, virtual visits don't replace in person, but I think we need them available because they're very helpful for many visits. The interesting point that you just made, because if there are those subtle changes on an exam that you can't pick up through a telemedicine visit or a virtual visit, there might be interventions or things you could do to try to help slow that progression. Is that right? Absolutely. So it might change our treatment recommendations. It might um, lead us down the road of maybe you have something else, right? So maybe you have a back issue that's causing some of these troubles. And so um, those, those types of assessments are very important. And like I said, I think the ideal situation would be a blend of virtual visits. Um, you know, an in-person visit once a year and maybe virtual a few times a year. Um, I think that might be a good plan for most people with MS. It's really helpful. Um, so we, we got a question from Diane who's watching us on Facebook and she says she's finding telemedicine hard to use because she's hard of hearing and she needs to use an interpreter. Um, and she's wondering if you have any suggestions for platforms uh, for video visits that might offer closed captioning or how have you had patients that have had this issue and are there solutions you might recommend? So we have a platform where we are allowed to connect with a patient with a translator um, and sign language is an option. Um, so there are platforms out there. I think speaking with your healthcare system, your healthcare provider's office about what they have available, um, but we can make available sign, like, sign language interpreters during visits as well as um, people who speak other languages as well, of course. Um, but if, if, if that might be a limitation, right, of virtual visits. And if you can't get to a solution that works for you, then we may need to do in-person visits, at least until we can find a solution that works for you. What we don't want to do is delay care in the meantime and for you to suffer in some way an outcome that could have been avoided if we hadn't delayed care. And all, I would assume all healthcare clinics right now are aggressively screening patients for COVID-19. Everyone is masked in the buildings. I mean, I, we're being very careful. So coming in for a visit doesn't mean you're going to get COVID-19. Um, hopefully, the clinic that you go to is being very careful, and I think that they all are. And so I think that's important to remember, too, that if you need to come in, you need to come in. And we're going to do everything we can to protect you. It's, it's interesting that you uh, said that. You're talking about the precautions that are being taken at a lot of the health centers. Um, and we had both Jean and Michael writing in to ask similar questions. So I'm going to skip ahead to theirs. Um, Jean was taking a disease modifying therapy that has altered her immune system. And she was asking about general safety, being out for things like going to the grocery store or if she were to have to go in on a clinic visit. Um, Michael was asking about the same thing. How safe are these types of interactions? And are there special precautions that someone with MS should be taking? 
Great question. So, you know, the, the medicines we use for MS alter your immune system. That's how they help you. Um, some of them suppress it more, some modulate it more. So some are a little friendlier in the infection risk department. Um, so it depends on what type of treatment you're on as to how aggressive we need to be in these measures. Getting back to going to the grocery store, for example, it's thought that the transmission of COVID-19 and similar viruses only occurs about three to 6% of the time through fomite transmission. That's touching something with COVID on it, touching your face accidentally and getting the infection. So from touching things, you're highly unlikely to get COVID-19. If everyone around you has a mask on that covers both their mouth and their nose, which is a key element of a mask, um, then the likelihood of you or them transmitting COVID-19 to one another is very low. So you might need to factor in, in the area where I live, how common are people wearing, how commonly are people wearing masks, right? If people, are, everyone's wearing masks in your grocery stores and in the parking lots, then it's probably relatively low risk for you to go. Um, and, you know, that reduces the cost of food delivery systems. Um, but if, if you feel like it's not very safe due to the, the local use of masks or other um, social distancing um, protections, um, then maybe we can't do that. So there's a lot of personal element and environmental elements in those decisions, um, but washing your hands frequently and always wearing a mask are crucial. It's really helpful. And wearing it appropriately or, or the right way, as you said. I can't tell you how many times I've been out and someone has it on their mouth, but not over their nose. And it's it's very important that they're worn the right way. Um, well, now that we're on the topic of COVID, uh, Felicia is asking if someone who has MS is more likely to get COVID. Um, we've talked about that in, in weeks past, but is there anything new or, or could we just go over you know some basic education about the risk level for people with MS just by having MS and then what do some of the DMTs do in terms of their risk for COVID-19? So I'm sure that you've all had some experts on before me that have been uh, much more adept uh, at this discussion. So if I say anything that conflicts with what they've said, let's go with them. But, uh, but I can share with you kind of my interpretation of the data that we have available. Um, and it is that, you know, patients who have MS and are on disease modifying therapy will be more likely to get COVID-19. Um, it's not dramatically higher. In fact, when COVID was first hitting, we were really, really worried as healthcare providers treating patients with MS that many of our patients would come down with COVID and many of them would do poorly. Now, they're getting it more frequently because they're on medicines that suppress or modulate the immune system, um, but it hasn't been an overwhelming frequency of, of contracting COVID-19. Um, the other thing is the outcomes have not been as bad as we had feared. Now, it doesn't mean that if you're on an aggressive therapy for MS, that you're not at a higher risk of a poor outcome with COVID, being having to go on a ventilator or even a higher rate of death. And in the early data that we've seen, those may be true, but it's not a dramatic increase in my understanding of the literature that's available, which is not very much. Um, so I think that being extra careful is important. I think having MS, if you're not on disease modifying therapy, really would not change your risk profile much at all. But if you are on disease modifying therapy, as many patients are, um, it does increase your risk of contracting this illness. And it might mean that you have a more aggressive uh, infection or course or more severe course. Um, so I think it's extra precautions are important. Medicines that more broadly immunosuppress you, so they're kind of less targeted therapies, if you will, are going to be more likely to cause you to have a higher risk of getting the infection and have a worse outcome. For example, medicines given via infusion. So if you go into an infusion center and get an infusion treatment, by and large, those suppress your immune system more. Um, so if you get one of those treatments, you may want to be more careful than even if you're on an oral or injectable therapy at home. Switching gears back to telemedicine, um, we heard from Angelique, who is also following us today on Facebook, and she's asking about underserved communities, those that have limited access to internet. And I know you talked about this a, a little bit earlier, but let's, let's talk a little bit more. She's saying, and what about older patients who may not um, know how to use these devices or these platforms? Um, uh, are there things that are being done to help 
patients that either don't have access or who are unfamiliar to ensure that they are able to see their providers and are not continuing to um, maybe increase disparities. Right. Uh, and as I mentioned before, that was a big concern at the beginning of telehealth was we were concerned that many patients who came from areas of, you know, a lower socioeconomic status or, or had lower financial resources, that they would not be able to um, acquire high quality care or video telehealth, if you will, and maybe they would be more likely to complete a phone visit. Um, we did some kind of basic searching based on zip code. Um, which somewhat links with that. And we did not actually find that to be as big of a problem. Um, but to your wise question, Angelique, uh, we did see that by age group, we saw a drop off in older patients. So we are seeing disproportionate delivery of care, at least in our health system for older patients, but we haven't seen an increase in disparity, at least that we can detect yet, um, in patients who are coming from income, uh, lower areas or zip codes. So we're hoping, and I think in my experience, I've seen the same, that it might make it harder to have Wi-Fi at home if you're having trouble making ends meet. But if you can't get to clinic because you don't have adequate transportation, it might be easier to borrow a smartphone for a visit. So we haven't seen it disproportionately affect people who maybe, uh, maybe have less uh, financial means. It sounds like you're tracking this, or is this something that, I know you can only speak to your center, is this something that you're following there proactively? We are, because again, our concern was, was we didn't want those who were already in tight spots to suffer more. And so we looked at that very early on. We looked at that in April and May and June. Um, and again, thankfully, we did not see that that was happening. Now, there have been large federal grants that came out through COVID funding, the CARES Act, um, to get Wi-Fi, to get internet access to rural communities, to poorer communities. Um, and we are steering a, a healthy uh, federal grant in Alabama to try to help with that, to get to people who don't have Wi-Fi or, or good cell phone service. So um, there are federal programs that are working on that. But as you know, the federal system can work at kind of glacial speed. So we want to help people today. And, and how can we help people today? And I think that's relying on, you know, community partners, uh, neighbors, friends, family. You know, if somebody in the, in the family has a smartphone with a video, let's borrow it on the morning of your visit. Yeah. Um, so we have a somewhat specific question, but I think it will probably apply to a lot of our viewers. And it's, again, talking about insurance coverage of telemedicine visits. Um, specifically, are you aware if Medicare is covering telemedicine visits for people with MS to see their MS healthcare provider? So great question. So the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services, called CMS for short, um, has approved it through, I believe, November 30th of this year, um, with probably future um, extensions, I would assume, coming. Um, but Seema Verma, who is the director of Medicare and Medicaid Services, uh, she said that the genie's out of the bottle. And, and I think she's right. I, I think once a patient sees their doctor from their couch, uh, it's going to be hard to convince them that they have to come back to clinic. Now, we have spent time today explaining there are times that it's important to come to clinic. So I'm not saying it replaces it, but it has shown people the capabilities of technology, the simplicity of technology. You know, in our system, patients don't have to download an app. They don't have to sign up for an account. They just get a text message and they click a link and it connects them to video. So it's really simple. Um, so I think now that people have had a taste of telemedicine, uh, in a large way, I think they're they're really hungry for it. And I think it's going to be hard for insurers to refuse them of these services in the future, Medicare, Medicaid, and private insurers. But I will add again, advocacy will help with that. If you think you've benefited from telehealth, you need to let your insurance company or provider know that you've benefited from telehealth. Because right now they're saying, we'll extend it through the end of the year. And they have not made it permanent. And it's made it difficult for large health systems like ours to plan for the future because we don't know what the future is going to be. We hope it involves telehealth, but we don't know. So um, we have some questions because it's flu season. I'm sure I don't need to tell you. 
Um, and we recently had a program where we talked about vaccines, but this is the time of year that everyone's thinking, what vaccine should I be getting? Um, and so we have a few people, Douglas and, and Linda both wrote in asking if someone with MS should get a flu shot. And I'll let you answer that. And then uh, Douglas had a, a little more specific question that might apply to our, our lar larger audience. So I wanna ask that, but I'll, I'll stop at, should someone with MS get a flu shot? So it is recommended that almost all patients with MS get a flu vaccination. Um, vaccinations in general, including flu and others, are not without risk, but the risk is very, very low for most vaccinations. The risk of you getting the flu and having had the flu, having an attack of your MS because your immune system is revved up, is much greater than having any ill effects from the flu vaccine. That said, for many patients with MS on certain disease-modifying therapies, you should not get live virus flu vaccines, which are not very popular. Um, there was an intranasal form um, that, that's used sometimes, but non-live virus vaccinations for the flu are very important for almost all patients with MS. And if you have any questions, of course, you can speak with your provider directly. So Douglas is saying that he's been working with his MS provider on switching his disease-modifying therapy. And he's wondering if vaccines should be timed um, in, in accordance with switching a disease-modifying therapy. Any general advice you have there? I know it's hard when you don't know which disease-modifying therapy from what to what, and you don't know Douglas specifically, but are there any general recommendations when it comes to switching a disease-modifying therapy and vaccinations? That's a great question. Um, there are some medications that you take for MS that, that stop the disease or control the disease that may lessen your response to a vaccine. So if I'm about to start someone on one of those treatments, I would tell them, hey, you need to get your flu vaccine now or your pneumonia vaccine or whatever it may be that you need before we start this medicine. So all I can say is that there are some medicines that you would want to vaccinate ahead of time before starting for MS because it would lessen your response to the vaccination. While we're on the subject of vaccines, um, we heard from Mindy, who is uh, turning 65, and her health care provider, her primary care provider, is not only recommending a flu vaccine, but for shingles and pneumonia. And she's wondering if the shingles vaccine and the pneumonia vaccine are safe for somebody living with MS. Again, generally speaking, yes. If those are recommended based on your age or other risk profiles, those are recommended. In fact, when we start some people on MS treatments, we actually give them those vaccines before they start those treatments, um, no matter what their age is. Now, I think you need to make sure that your primary care provider knows what medicines you're on for your MS, because those may lessen your response to them, and it may change the type of vaccination they choose to do. Um, but aside from that, yeah, if your primary care provider thinks you need these vaccinations, um, it's most likely worth going through them. She had a follow-up question, if I may, and you might um, punt this back to her primary care, but she's asking, is it safe to have all of those vaccines at the same time? It depends on the vaccine as to what can be administered at the same time. Um, so actually in the vaccination pamphlets, the doctors have access to or the providers, uh, it'll tell them if it's safe to give with other vaccinations. So yeah, she can ask her primary care. But from an MS perspective, it would just be per the recommendations of the vaccination. Well, I know we asked you to come today to talk about telemedicine and I've stretched <laughs> knowing that you are an MS specialist. And I'm entertaining a lot of the other questions that we're getting from our viewers, so I appreciate that. Um, interestingly, we have uh, Milburn and Alessandra are, are thinking about the life expectancy for somebody living with MS. And Alessandra was interested to learn if someone can die from MS. And then Milburn heard that African-American men, so it's very specific, have a nine-year shorter life expectancy rate. Um, so I'll ask you to comment on, can someone die from MS? Is the life expectancy less for someone with MS? And then if there's anything known uh, about African-Americans or, or Blacks who live with MS. 
Great questions. Um, so there, the 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 kind of the best study that I've seen to date um, came out um, maybe four or five years ago on life expectancy in MS and showed a reduction of about seven years on average for people living with MS. And so that's the number I provide to my patients is that, um, you know, if you average every MS patient, um, you can say that on average, they will live seven years shorter um, than, than people without MS or the general population, I should say. Um, now, taking into account that, these are averages, right? And this is the same discussion I have with patients about treatments. I tell you the average reduction of disease activity. I don't tell you the individual reduction of disease activity. So when you begin to drill down in those numbers and you look at men versus women, for example, men's lifespan with MS is shorter than women. And you look at African-Americans lifespan in that population and it may be lower. And so when you get to, when you start to drill down and look at the individual characteristics of groups, you may see different numbers. Now, getting back to the question about um, do African Americans or, or Blacks with MS, do they live uh, less time um, than, than Caucasians, maybe? So, to that question, African Americans do seem to have more aggressive disease activity. They seem to have more disability at diagnosis. And that's true in some studies, even when you account for socioeconomic status. So that's insurance status, income in the household, et cetera. So it does seem that maybe African-American genetics or ethnicity is somehow driving a more aggressive disease. So we, I'm just checking my time. I've, I've got a few questions here. Uh, we always get lots of questions about symptom management. And I know we could probably spend an hour on, on this. So I, I just want to mention that Karen and Josh are both writing in about pain, pain that comes from MS. Um, and they're asking for solutions, like what can they do? And I know that's a harder question for you to answer. You don't know Karen and Josh, but maybe you could tell us about MF pain, what it is, why do we have it? Um, that's probably easier than how do you manage it? Yeah. Um, so, you know, in a large cohort, um, this has been 15 years ago, probably, they, they looked at symptomatology in MS patients, people who had MS for a long time. Uh, and in that group, it was several thousand MS patients, 43% reported pain. Um, in my experience, I think it's a little higher than that. And, and maybe they parsed out well pain versus spasticity, for example. Spasticity is a major cause of pain for patients. If your muscles are tight and pulling constantly, it hurts, um, no matter why they're tight. Um, so I think the first thing is drilling down as to why you have pain. That's the first key element. Um, you know, is it spasticity? Is it the fact that your hip is now rotated because of weakness in your leg, and that's led to arthritis in your hip, for example. Um, so the first question is, why do we have pain? And I also remind people in these conversations, unfortunately, just because you have MS does not mean that you're immune to other troubles. Low back pain is very common, right? And many of us have that. And if you have low back pain, it might be different from MS. Your neurologist may still be able to help with it, but we don't want to bark up the wrong tree and delay care for a back issue as we're chasing our tail with muscle relaxants or gabapentin or other neuropathic pain agents when actually it's a musculoskeletal issue. So I think the big thing is drilling down to try to figure out what it is. Don't forget that other things can cause pain, even if you have MS. And don't be shy to explore those other things with other doctors. Well, what you just said reminded me of something I wanted to ask you when we were talking about life expectancy. And I've got to toss this back to John in about one minute, so no pressure here. Um, but we were talking about life expectancy, and we were, you were just mentioning that not everything is MS-related, that you can have pain that's not related to your MS. What could someone do if they are trying to protect their overall health and they're trying to ensure they have the longest life expectancy possible? Are there things outside of their MS that they could be working on? Absolutely. And so the more data we see, the more we have learned that taking care of your body is important for MS. And I talk so much about exercise and weight loss and eating healthy with patients 
that it's like a broken record in my head. I just have that conversation over and over again all day, every day, because we see MS outcomes that are better in people who eat better, in people who exercise, in people who take care of their mental health. So we, we focus on MS, right? Because that's what's in front of us. But if you can't see the forest for the trees, you're going to suffer more than you have to. And so you need to think about taking care of yourself, your whole self, and eating well, exercising, and finding time for yourself from a mental health perspective. That's incredibly important, especially in the pandemic. Yeah. Well, great words of, uh, of wisdom to, <laughs> to end on. Thank you so much, Dr. Metter. I'll turn it back to you, John. Thanks, Julie. And thanks to all of you who submitted your questions. And thank you once again, Dr. Metter, for joining us today. I think that one of the best things that anyone can do for themselves, especially during these uncertain times, is to make sure that the information they're getting is credible and reliable. So we'd like to share some resources with you. And these are the resources that you can really count on. I want to remind you that if we were unable to get to your questions today, the National MS Society's MS Navigator team is your best partner in answering your questions and connecting you to the very best information and resources. You can contact an MS Navigator by phone, by email, or through the MS Society's website. I'd also like to acknowledge that we're in the midst of an emotionally difficult time for so many people. And I wanna make sure that you're aware that the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline is available 24 hours a day, seven days a week. They offer free and confidential support for people in distress, as well as suicide prevention and crisis resources for you or your loved ones. You can reach them by calling 1-800-273-TALK. That's 273-8255. For more information about Dr. William Matter, Matter's work, well, please visit uabmedicine.org. Every week on the Real Talk MS podcast, I continue the conversation that we start here. So I hope you'll take a few minutes and give Real Talk MS a listen. You'll find the Real Talk MS podcast at realtalkms.com, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Pandora, Amazon Music, or wherever you find your favorite podcasts. With vital funding from supporters like you, the National MS Society will work to ensure that resources and programs like today's are available, and that MS research rebounds quickly from the COVID-19 pandemic so that the progress and momentum toward finding a cure continues. As you're able, please make a donation to the Society's COVID-19 Response Fund by texting the word GIVE to 68686, and you'll get a link right to the MS Society's COVID-19 Response Fund webpage. I hope you'll consider contributing today. You can connect with the National MS Society on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, and LinkedIn, and please make sure that you're on the Society's mailing list so you'll continue to receive the latest information on MS and updates on upcoming programs like this one. I'd like to thank Dr. William Metter for joining us today, and I'd like to thank everyone who's joined us for your really great questions. Please remember that a recording of this webinar is going to be available for your review on the Society's website, and you'll find it at nationalmssociety.org slash msexpert. And now I have a favor to ask each of you. Getting your feedback on today's webinar is important. So you'll see a survey pop up in a moment when we close out. And if you're watching on Facebook Live, you'll see a link to that survey pinned to the comments section. And on YouTube, you'll find that link in the program description. Completing the survey makes a real difference. The information you provide helps us continuously improve and it helps shape future programs. The survey takes just one minute, so I hope you'll take a minute and please fill it out. On behalf of Dr. William Metter and the National MS Society, I wanna thank you once again for joining us. Please stay safe and make healthy choices.